Hello, this meeting is meeting 13 of the Visual Tools group where a different closure library creators and tool creators and users meet to discuss experiences and working pro progress projects and discuss collaborations and hopes for the future. Today, we will have two interesting talks. One by Adham about the shiny framework uh, of the R ecosystem for interactive data visualizations. And another one by Jamie about creating interactive animations in Clojure Script for some Bayesian inference. And as always, we will begin by introducing ourselves. So uh, each one of you is invited to tell something about yourself, about your hopes, about what you're interested in. And yeah, maybe uh, let us begin with Michael, if he's okay. Would you like to tell something about yourself? First, I have to check if there's any other Michaels here, just to make sure you're talking about me. Um, so I'm uh, the first area that I really got involved with computers was um, graphic design and typesetting. Um, and then I rapidly went from there into databases and have left the visual realm almost entirely and have felt a huge gap there. Um, so I've wanted to um, learn how to um, build up my skills to be able to do visual representations of a lot of the back end systems and um, data structures that I'm interested in working with, um, as well as um, I've got an interest in code representation and beautiful, in particular, beautiful code representation. And I have such an incredible lack of skill in both of these areas. Um, so I'm at least going to try to have some of the knowledge that all of you have, hopefully just at least rub off on me, or I can pretend that I'm doing something because I'm, I'm watching all of you do wonderful things. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and maybe uh, Teodo, would you tell something about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have a bit of an unusual background. I used to be a civil engineer, so I worked with bridges and stuff. Uh, <laughs> but I like programming, so I became a programmer. Uh, and uh, now I'm starting to get more and more interested in product work. Um, so uh, I'm here because I'm really excited about the Visual Tools initiative, and I think uh, it has potential for showing lots of great stuff. So I'm just uh, happy for Daniel uh, making all of this happen, and I'm really excited for uh, yeah the speakers today. I'm, I want to see what's happening. Yeah, thank you, Theodore, and thank you for your recent support and you know pushing some of the meetings behind the scenes. It is amazing to have you involved. And yeah, and maybe uh, how, yeah, how, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce uh, your name. Uh, yeah. My name is Hugo. Uh, somehow we couldn't hear you well. Maybe you're a bit and too close. The, uh, oh. We're. Oh, here we go. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank okay, you. Great. <laughs> My name is Hugh. I work for ATA, and we are a closure shop. I work mostly in the back back end, so I'm interested in anything, you know, with, with the visual tools on the front end. Uh, you know, closure is a very great dynamic language, and so I'm pretty excited. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and maybe uh, Riyad, Riyad, would you like to tell me about yourself? Yeah, yeah, sure, Daniel. Uh, let me try to see if I can. Oh, okay, cannot pull the camera now. Sorry, but uh, but I'm you, happy to... we hear you very well. Oh, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Daniel. I'm happy to be here. Uh, actually, it's my first time to be here and around the closure community. Uh, I'm I'm mainly I'm currently like data science and and research associate. Uh, currently based in in Istanbul, but I have finished my master's degree in computer science. Uh, from Armenia, American University of Armenia. Uh, I'm mostly doing all the, uh, I'm on the data analysis side, obviously. I know this is a small part from of, of your community, but 
I'm mostly now doing my data analysis in, in R. Uh, previously, I have done the analysis in also uh, Python and, and I have other exposure for different languages, but I'm happy here to, to hear from you and learn and maybe explore new topics for me. So uh, nice meeting you all. Thank you so much. So nice to meet for the first time. And, you know, to you and to anybody who is new to Clojure, uh, this community is really looking to create a good experience for you. So if anything is difficult or confusing or blocking, then let us talk. Let us just chat afterwards and see how we could make it easier for you to, to be part of this. And wonderful to meet. Um, Adrian, would you like to tell something? Hi. Um, I'm primarily interested in building visual tools that make it easier to program. And um, I have a UI library called Membrane, which I use to make various experiments. And so I'm always interested to see what everybody else is doing to learn and get better. Wonderful, thank you so much. And Zay? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Zane. I'm the uh, platform engineering lead for the Inference QL project. It's a, a query language for, um, well, it's a software system for automatically building and querying probabilistic models. Um, yeah, and uh, this is my first time at this meeting. Uh, looking forward to uh, getting to know you all. Fantastic, thank you. And Mark, hello. Hi, how are you doing? Hey all. Uh, yeah, I've been involved in the visual tools world um, on and off. I've been uh, away for a few months, but um, thought I'd stop back in and try to get back up to speed. Wonderful to meet again. Yeah, and Adham? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, I am a data analyst with a background in finance. I've worked with R for the past uh, two to three months, and I've gotten into closure in the past couple of weeks. Uh, loving the ecosystem. There's a lot of, uh, uh, I have a lot of interest in visual tools and in building uh, ways to visualize data to get and gain insights from the data. And I think the way Clojure uh, treats data lends itself well to how data is uh, processed and manipulated and visualized. So it's interesting being in this uh, community. Fantastic, thank you. And Jamie? Hey, um, um, I've been a uh, open source developer for a number of years working on the Moodle learner management system, uh, freelancing, um, contributing to core and producing plugins that um, work with Moodle. I've been wanting to get into functional programming for a while and looking for ways to, um, to use functional programming in, in the real world. And, um, and it seems like closure might be a path to do that. I might be able to um, learn enough closure and closure script to um, to produce something of value for people. I, I really like um, the working with a language that has a, a strong philosophy behind it, um, and it it. Um, yeah, I I love the the idea of um, of separating out um, processing. Yeah, that's it. Moodle. Yeah, processing um, uh, <clears throat> processes and processing and transforming data to uh, to state. Um, that kind of separation seems a big step forward for programming. And I'm, I'm hoping that I can um, take part in, um, in pushing that forward. Thanks. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, so I guess now we will go about the presentations by Adam and Jamie. And we have about 75 minutes to the official time. So we have lots of time. So each of you could say, talk and discuss your topic for about half an hour. And then we have 15 more minutes uh, to, to chat further. And maybe then stay later on if anybody wishes to stay. And but I'm just saying that so that we know we're flexible and we could change it uh, through the process to see how we go. And yeah, so Adam, would you like to begin? Yes. Let me get the screen sharing to. Can you all see the big beamer? Yeah. Yes, great. All right, so uh, I'll be doing a showcase of uh, Shiny, which is an R package. I'll be mainly talking about the concepts behind Shiny and telling an experience of uh, using Shiny in a real world project and the many aspects that makes Shiny interesting to work with. Uh, First of all, Shiny works in R. R is a language for statistical computing and graphics. It's a free and open source language. It has a lot of statistical functionality built into its core. So it lends itself well to use by statisticians. And like what I love about R is like there is, you can quickly start working with it. Like you get the, for example, data in CSV format. You can quickly build plots. Uh, the language is easy to read. It's based on S. It's inspired by Scheme, which I like learned about while I was doing research. There is some uh, inspiration from Lisp languages in R. And it's used for data wrangling, manipulation, visualization, analysis, and research in many fields, finance, medicine. And it's also used for building dashboards. Uh, cool things about R. Like this is what made me stick to R for a long time. Uh, Ripple, uh, Ripple driven development, uh, similar to Clojure, you can just work in the Ripple, uh, manipulate your data, uh, visualize it quickly. Uh, it uh, shortens the time between thinking and getting things out. Like this ability to just immediately work with your data uh, makes it very fun to work with. Uh, it's extensible. Uh, you can write packages for R and the ecosystem is very large and very active and expanding. Uh, many packages such as the Tidyverse, Shiny, and Knitter. Uh, Tidyverse is a, basically a universe of packages for manipulating and visualizing data. Uh, ggplot2 is one of uh, the most famous uh, visualization packages for R. Uh, Shiny is what I'll talk about today. And Knitter enables you to basically do literate programming where you have documentation, have code blocks, knit them together, export that to HTML, PDF, and show that off very quickly. And my favorite, like th th this, this is very fun, the piping macro, which is basically for closure users, it's a thread first macro where you write an expression and you pipe the output of the expression to the expression that follows. So filter to plot and so on. So threading functionality in R. Shiny is an R package built on R that makes it easy to build interactive web applications from R. Uh, it's mainly used for quick prototypes, MVPs, and web applications. Shiny uh, embodies the easiness in terms that once you know R, reading a bit about Shiny, you can use Shiny to uh, build a web application with little to no web background. And that's a very powerful thing. And it's uh, one of the points that I'll discuss about in my like ideas for like Shiny enclosure. Uh, it has reactivity built in. So the application reacts to the user's changes and inputs without having to write JavaScript. And like, like basically without getting your hands dirty with the JavaScript, you can write R, 
and have that deal with the interaction. Uh, Shiny has modules, which enable you to reuse and organize code. I'll show a demonstration of uh, how useful modules can be later on, but they enable the user, the developer, or a team of developers to work together on a project and have no interference between them. And basically, one person can write module A, another can write module B, and another can write module C, and they all develop together and incorporate the modules into a single big application. Uh, I'll get a bit into the application structure. So what comes next makes sense. Uh, Shiny can be as simple as a single file with a UI function and a server function. The UI function describes how things appear on the page and the server function basically fills in that functionality. For example, you can have a slider in the UI that interacts with uh, a display, a, a table display or a table output in the server. Uh, and it can be modularized, modularized to a UI uh, file or UI code and server code and have those called. In much bigger application, uh, users tend to go for frameworks such as uh, Golem, which is used to build robust Shiny applications. And it models the application in an R package format with an R directory, a dev directory, and directories for R development. I'm not gonna get into the details of those because that's unnecessary for like seeing the big picture of Shiny, but it's uh, a well-organized system. And I'll come back to this later on when talking about like the simplicity principle of closure and how that can get into the, in the way of uh, new developers such as me, because I'm new to closure. Uh, the process of building an application with Shiny is very simple. You design your UI, you build with the modules and you incorporate everything together. It's uh, straightforward to get started with. Uh, reactivity and modules. I'll show a number of demos for reactivity before delving deeper into them, because it's one of these things where like, I wanted to talk about it first then show, but showing is much more telling than uh, just straight up talking. So I'll change my sharing to desktop one. Did the sharing move to Firefox, hopefully, please? Yes. Great, so let me just show this below. So this is a complete web application written in Shiny with, and only with R. This is great because uh, after learning R, you can immediately start building applications that you can show and that you can put on your portfolio or uh, show your experience with, and of course, your ideas with. Uh, reactivity basically describes the simple yet very powerful mechanism behind, for example, choosing a data set and having all the data changes with the choice of the user. Uh, for example, here we have a number of observations that we can change to change our observations. We can change text and have that text change. And here I'll just show a, an overview of the R code. Uh, takes a UI function. That is a, what they call fluid pages, which is how the components are organized. Uh, like there is a lot of abstraction in Shiny it uh, takes away a lot of choices. I'll get to that. Uh, here we declare the, for example, panels. We, the, like, there's a lot of declaring in Shiny. You declare the layout, you declare a panel and you create your inputs and you create your outputs. So, an input is where something the user can change and an output is something the user can see. And the 
outputs can interact with the inputs through your reactivity. Here, the server function simply uh, runs a reactive switch, which updates on the user's input. So it goes for all data sets and for another even simpler demo. This basically builds a histogram with observations and you can change the number of observations and everything changes. And all of this is done with just this simple or deceptively simple because there's a lot of abstraction here uh, are normal for the input and then plot that as a histogram. Then we go back to the slideshow. Great. So how does this all happen? Uh, in Shiny, there are three components to reactivity. We have reactive values, reactive expressions, and observers. The reactive values are values the user can interact with and that the user can change. They are the source of reactivity. And they can be linked to an expression or an observer. Uh, an observer is simply an output. It's an endpoint that we see. While an expression is simply a function that updates only when the input changes. This is useful for caching results and for performing expensive computations, reading data from a file, because we don't want to rerun functions every time. Like, we don't want to rerun the same function three times for three different outputs. The reactive expression basically is updated once, and then its value is passed to the observer. The, was this understood? And uh, are there any questions about uh, reactivity? Yeah, maybe one question, if yeah. that is okay. Yeah, so go ahead. These, all these three, these are server side notions, right? They are about the R runtime, not about the browser, right? Yeah, like uh, these are processed all on the server side, like the expressions. The, these all live like the the declaring of expressions lives in the server side of the application. So when you have a UI side and a server side, all this is declared and happens in the server side. So the user does like declare what gets uh, updated reactively, and they choose where that uh, output is where it goes. So for example, in the demo I showed, it goes into the table, it goes into the uh, list of items that we can then manipulate by reducing or increasing the number of observations that we see. Thank you. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd yeah. like to ask, um, does um, Shiny determine which expressions are reactive expressions or are all of your expressions reactive? Are, no, no. Um, are there some? Yeah, there is some code. Uh, the reactive expressions are wrapped in a reactive, uh, like reactive syntax. It basically, mm -hmm. let me show that. Is, where is, there we go. Reactive. See this reactive code is wrapped in like reactive parentheses, then a curl braces, and then anything that goes in becomes reactive. And you call uh, the reactive fu uh, function comes here, there to expression. You see. Yeah. 
It is called in the output summary and in the output view. And it's called as a function. Yeah, thanks. Uh so you like the uh, the developer determines what is uh, reactive and what is not. Interesting, because I was just um, um, thinking of this compared to what I'm going to present later, where um, closure script the closure script compiler itself mm -hmm. determines you have your state for the application and the um, the. Uh, I created a reactive, a React um, application where the compiler determines um, what needs to be updated when the state changes all of your functions. There's not a, 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 um, a difference between a reactive and a non-reactive function in closure, closure script. Yeah, that's... No. The that's interesting. I saw the demo for, uh, like, it, it was very reactive-like, uh, but I didn't uh, get the time to read the code. So I'll be very interested in seeing how you got it to, like, determine which is reactive and which is not, because, uh, and how that is, uh, like, uh, how, how that's processed in Closure Script. Like, I'm looking forward to see how you do that, because, uh, I think both approaches have their pros and cons because uh, in Shiny, uh, when you declare what's reactive, you know exactly what computations are gonna happen, like what and when it happens. So you know how the resources are gonna work out, but like if the compiler determines, I don't know what's gonna be reactive and what's not gonna be reactive. So how will the load be balanced and all that. and I have to reiterate, I'm a beginner in closure, so uh, state is still just a bit beyond my, under my understanding, but I'm getting there. Great. Any more questions? All right, great. Uh, that will be that for reactivity because it's a much, much deeper topic. And what uh, the main question that I'm asking myself right now, and I want to ask you guys, is how will reactivity be implemented in uh, closure? So that's one of the like that's the question I'm taking from Chinese reactivity into closure. How will we? How will that be implemented in Clojure and how will that be used? Uh, modules, I think, is something Clojure already does. So uh, a module in uh, Shiny basically couples the UI function and the server function in a module.r file. And then these modules are called in app server and app UI. Uh, this enables code organization and the reusability of code. Uh, so if I have a map module, I can use different data sets with the same map and get the same and, the, and get the same visualizations. And so I, I only have to write the code once and then reuse it. Uh, I see this perhaps as namespaces, like uh, a single closure file represents a module with its UI and server, and then that gets called. Or maybe, I don't know exactly how to, I don't know how to see modules in closure yet. So I'll demonstrate them. I'll show some structure for them and I can hear from the people with more experience in closure how this can be implemented. Uh, Shiny's ecosystem is large. It has Golem, which is a framework for building Shiny applications. It has Shiny Dashboard, which is an, yet another abstraction that helps with the uh, building dashboards. So with Shiny das Dashboard and BS4 Dash, you basically declare the layout and then you'll have the entire application and I'll show that. 
and I've been talking a lot about showcases. So I'll be showing a real world use scenario of uh, Shiny, Golem, and uh, dashboarding. Uh, this is, uh, I worked on this as a data intern uh, in a research company in Iraq, because that's where I live. Uh, it uh, visualizes the Iraqi imports for a whole year, and it shows them in multiple ways, as in multiple graphs. Sure. Let me appear. Is the does it show the application? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, here we worked with Shiny to build a visual representation of the imports by the country and by their values. Uh, each of these the map, the circles, and the bar uh, graphs are a module. So when developing, uh, we were three developers working on the project, and the supervisor is uh, Real, who is present with us. And two of us worked on the backend, basically, and the third developer worked on the UI of the entire application. So what happens is the, uh, the UI is written and the backend is plugged into the UI. So uh, here, for example, we have this uh, map module, which is a leaflet. Uh, if anyone here has worked with leaflet, which is a library for uh, showcasing uh, maps, we have the data set organized by import categories. And the user can basically select any category and see the map update showing each country and showing tooltips and all that. Uh, this data here, total imports by USD, by IQD, by kilogram, uh, percent, this is a module. And this module is reused in all three tabs and the code written for this module is one. So the same code is used in different places and is used with the same data set. Here we have a bar plot that shows the imports by selected country and for a specific category or all categories, it's all reactive. It uh, the code here interacts with a basically I don't want to call it a CSV file because it's uh, it's a binary for R, which makes the loading of the data quicker. But basically, the state updates whenever, like the state of the application updates whenever a, any input is changed, and this happens across the, all the modules. And this application was written by three people with little to no web development background. And I think that's the main and greatest strength of Shiny is it enables the developer to create applications that can be uh, published. Uh, it's not published yet, but it will be public soon. Uh, will be public soon and uh, this will be served to a lot of people and it will be handling, handling requests so the application will be under a lot of load when it's public. Uh, what's uh, the experience with Shiny has a lot of pros and cons. The main pro is that we used what we already know, which is R, to build this application. And the cons are we don't know web development. So when we wanted to modify some elements, such as the bars on the right, on the left, we wanted to put them on the top, we had to 
get our hands working with JavaScript, and that was too much work to modify such a simple element that we just opted to not uh, deal with it. And here is my question for Closure itself. How would we present Shiny in Closure? Because Shiny abstracts a lot of uh, code, which can lead to issues when the developer wants to change something as simple as uh, where an element is. Uh, I've seen work with uh, Clojus, which uh, Daniel, I think you worked uh, you worked on. Yeah, uh, it it's not uh, the interop is with R, not shiny. Sorry for the grammar here. Uh, it basically leaves the R abstraction in R and brings uh, the interop, and you just basically call the functions and uh, call it with the same structure. I thought about reagent and providing templates to use uh, shiny like uh, capabilities where you basically declare a ui or like in the reagent element you create the ui element and then you embed the sir the uh, reactive functionality in that but uh, that also needs uh, more discussion so and another question came to mind which is uh, from my understanding of the closure ecosystem, it's mainly library based rather than framework based. Uh, when I started working on a project, I found myself searching for libraries rather than picking a framework and working with it. So, would Shiny Enclosure even be plausible? Like, who would use a complete framework such as Shiny Enclosure? Uh, I think the main use case for this is for people new to Clojure who want to get uh, applications running quick, like me, uh, like just maybe a number of kindly functions uh, that uh, ease up the operation or a framework in itself. So I wanna hear uh, any questions, if there are any, and what would an, a framework like Shiny look like in Clojure? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, you know, for bringing clarity to this topic, which, you know, for me has been confusing always. And now yeah, you draw the picture for us about it and also such an inspiring use case to see. And, and yeah, it would be great to discuss these questions. Maybe it makes sense after Jamie's presentation where we see reagent, for example. So we have a little taste of how it looks like in Clojure Script. And so we have a little time before we move to Jamie's presentation. So if Adam, you wish to comment about anything, or if anybody has a question or comment, it is a good time. Can we just talk if we want to say something? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I, yeah, I noticed you, you commented on how to model reactivity uh, in Clojure, uh, Adam. Uh, and uh, I was wondering whether you're aware that atoms can be subscribed to? Uh, on the reading list. Uh, the OK, so for a quick background and what I already know about Clojure. Yeah. I'm going through the, uh, I finished the getting started guide yeah. and I started uh, going through the reference. I read the reader, I know about the repo, how evaluation happens. I'm still far from atoms, agents, vars and references. So uh, do tell me how Clojure deals with the, <laughs> this. Uh, I'm happy to learn, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got a REPL running, so I can see if I can show something. Uh, let me just see if this works. <laughs> I'm on a Linux. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe maybe we could um, delay this till we we're looking at my app because it's a it's a reagent app with um, states uh, maintained in atoms, and um, we I I might not do justice to explain it very well. So maybe um, if uh, 
if anyone else wants to chime in to to explain things better than me then um uh, uh, let's have a discussion about uh about closure script and how it works based on looking at my app as an example of um I, that, that might be better than it might be better have to, to have an example in front of us yeah jamie it, it would be great to move to your presentation in a moment uh, but mm -hmm. we, we do have a little more time before shifting to your topic so it, i think it is fine to stay with that a bit longer and so theodore if you think it is something you could demonstrate briefly uh, you know the notion of an atom i think it would actually be useful at this point okay i'll just see if it if this uh works then uh, I, I i agree jamie you're definitely going to touch on this so uh, i don't know whether i'm going to provide anything um and i'm also seeing that my share screen button from zoom doesn't do what i expect <laughs> so i don't think i'm going to be able to share my screen regardless so uh yeah i suggest we just keep going one mm. uh, topic i kept hitting up uh, when like learning closure and thinking about training closure is like the simplicity and the like how easy do you, do we want to make it for closure users to work because uh <clears throat> when learning there are many like built systems like uh, devs.eden and Linning, and i had to learn about those uh when going for a database i had to learn about the like three libraries uh closure.gdbc and gdbc next and that's a lot of like learning to get going with a topic as simple as uh, like working with a uh, with some ui in the web and reagent is simple but it still requires uh, some learning so how much simplicity can be sacrificed in order to gain ease with uh, something like shining closure um i think part of the there's some there's typically some trade-offs there where um when you simplify things you often end up with more options which makes it harder to learn and there's um what you try to do is you try to make simple things and then you try to find the common use cases and then have packages of the simple things and um a lot of the other ecosystems have much bigger communities and so they can package the different options um much more readily because they just have more people working on it so they can um and then the other issue is that when you build things more simply um or yeah you know, when you have more uh um what was i getting that um how oh, i was going somewhere with this um all right, come back to me. I will finish that thought. Did you mean to explain simple things and easy things and the trade-offs? My copy is still kicking in. One, once, uh, go, maybe somebody else uh, can give an answer. Yeah, it is such a central question to everything we're doing and, and and yeah i think the truth is we don't have anything like shine there are a few things which are interesting steps in that direction but something as complete this kind of experience that you demonstrated where one actually does not need to know anything about web development and actually go very far this way that is something that we don't have in closure at the moment and there are a few interesting attempts at that uh, area, I think. 
Okay, I remember what I was trying to say is that you, if you have a lot of simple things, you can kind of recombine them and put them in different configurations to do what you want. So you were mentioning with your application where you, it, it's really easy, you get started and there's this side panel. And then you wanna do, you wanna put the side panel on top. But doing that is, you know, really hard to do. You There's a lot of work and you kind of have to basically redo that all in your work yourself. The idea is you wanna make things simple so that when you make wanna make a simple change, you can kind of recombine the pieces. Um, I think Clojure does a good job of making it easy to do, make simple things, um, whereas other ecosystems don't necessarily do that. So basically, you get one framework or two frameworks um, because it's so hard to do anything that basically everybody builds on top of React um, or whatever the, the main thing is, whereas in Clojure, um, it's easier to make simple things. So there's not necessarily as much coalescing around uh, one particular option. Um, because it's easy to recombine different pieces. And um, there's this kind of trade-off between the simplicity where you can kind of make, uh, recombine the pieces, which gives you a lot of flexibility and kind of ease of use, which is basically a package of these uh, different um, capabilities into one easy way to do it. Um, there's an old Alan Kay quote where you um, make the common case easy and the complex case possible. And the way you do that is you build simple components and then you compose them together um, I think Clojure does that really well. I think a lot of other ecosystems basically just like they have one option and it does the one uh, and everybody kind of works on that one one framework. Um, and it's tough for Clojure because obviously you do want you, you do need new people coming to Clojure and trying things, but um, kind of packaging those common use cases is still a lot of work because it takes a lot of polish and there's a lot of like drudgery that's not really fun. And um, without a bigger, with a, you know, with like a million React developers, you can kind of like go for each use case and like package things together. Whereas um, Closure really like succeeds, you can do the simple pieces. And then so when there's something you want to build, you can often do it in Closure because it's like if there's a, a, there's a Closure library, you can combine the different pieces and you can make it work just the way you want um, because you have all the different options. Whereas like if it's all glommed together, it's like, oh, it does 90% of what I want, and the last 10% is impossible because it's like it's all directly connected. Um, and kind of talking about how you were thinking about reactivity, um, there's the what, which is like you have all the different steps and how they're all their dependencies, they're how they're connected. So A depends on B, depends on C, which may depend on two different steps. So you have the what, um, and you really want to enclosure the way is you really wanted that separated from how. So there's um, multiple ways to implement that. You can use the watches that Teodoro was mentioning, but um, you know, there's also, um, you could have that same representation of what the steps are and their dependencies and have multiple ways to run it. So you could have it, so it runs stuff in parallel. So it runs some stuff on the server and some stuff in the client where it, it um, creates a different query, a oh, different plan for executing it. Um, and then there's different libraries that kind of help you do that. Um, and often it comes down to just building a graph and there's a graph library that just is generic. And using that graph, you can spit out a plan that you can just execute. So um, I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling now, so. Beautiful, thank you. Michael. Yeah, I, I wanna follow on, on on what a lot of people have been saying here. I think one of the challenges because closure is so flexible and we want, uh, there's a lot of us that value that flexibility and that composition. Um, and there's, to choose to do, um, the, make the easy thing, where so many people that have self-selected into closure are reluctant to cut off the paths that are necessary to make the easy thing. Like design is choice, right? You have to make a choice. And a lot of us are saying, well, I want those options available. And being able to own that design choice and say, look, this is what I want to accomplish. And, and not necessarily feel like you need to apologize for that. You're not going to be everything to everybody. That's what the general, that's what closure the language and the ecosystem is for. Like saying you have a shiny, um application sorry the now the pun on shiny is making me smile the um 
the use case for Shiny is incredibly valuable, right? It's not going to be everything to everybody. And to say, look, this is what we're doing. And for both for people on the outside say, oh, I want all of this configuration. That can be really hard for a developer to say, look, that's actually just not what I'm trying to do here. I recognize what you're trying to do. It's not actually part of our project. And um, navigating that is difficult, but I think to have a successful, I would actually call, call Shiny more of an application as opposed to a framework or like Shiny itself being an application. Um, because it's got so many design choices already made in it. Um, I think that's perfectly valid and just owning that and saying, hey, this is what we're, we've decided we're going to do. We recognize these are the trade-offs, being upfront and honest about them and saying, yes, this is what we're doing and we're going to do an excellent job at it. Um, so that's my, my take on the whole. Um, we need both. Um, and um, it's not one or the other. It's like, no, we have to um, recognize that there are both use cases. I'm seeing the same place in the note-taking community right now. It's like, oh, we want to do all of these things. It's like, none of you are good at anything in particular. <laughs> but, so, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, looking at the time, I think it would be good to move to Jamie's part and maybe Theodore, maybe later, it would be good to have your kind of explanation about atoms if it works. Uh, what do you think, Jamie? Thank you. Oh, sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe um, Theodore's uh, presentation on atoms will make a bit more sense having seen um, a closure script application. Um, I I don't think I can explain in detail the the internals of how how closure script handles tracking change of state. Um, so I, I, it'll be interesting to hear Theodore um, go into that. Let me share my screen here. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a beginner with um, Mm, closure and closure script wanting to uh, learn about how to how to program with with both I, I I hadn't previously had any experience with closure script before I uh, started putting this this app together I um, yeah, I I thought this was a good the the motivation to create this thing was to to explore the ideas that I'm learning about in um, in relation to Bayesian statistics. Where I'm taking part in a study group with which Danielle set up, um, where we're going through um, the wonderful book um, Statistical Rethinking, um, which presents. Um, a uh, Bayesian approach to a very practical Bayesian approach to statistics, and uh, I, I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone. I'd uh, I'd use this as a uh, use uh, this as a project. Use um, I, I thought I'd create this application to kind of, to visualize some of the ideas that I was learning about to as an opportunity to to learn more about closure script uh, as well as to kind of cement what I was learning from um, about Bayesian statistics um, I So I'll, I'll just walk you through what I've done here in this this app. I this is uh, this is a closure script app um, using Reagent, um, and I'll I'll just show 
show you what it does before delving into the code a little bit, the code. Um, so let's see if we can get more on the screen. Ah, I really need to see more. There we go. I thought it would be cool to to animate the the process of um, of um, to animate a calculation to animate the. The, the this process of um, learning from a number of samples of data. After each sample, we're updating our knowledge about the world, and um, yeah, I. I um I wanted to kind of um to to help with my own intuition of of um how of uh, of how this Bayesian inference works that um With each uh, with each sample, I, yeah, I don't know how to how far to go into explaining Bayes' theorem. I'm not gonna. I don't, I don't think that's the place for this. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm not gonna try and explain what you're it's too much of what you're seeing here. I I don't think um, you want a, an explanation of a Bayes. Yeah, it is not theory. not the focus of of this meeting. You could tell something about that, well, yeah. if you wish. The these are the these are the this is the evidence that the um, that is gradually being introduced, um, and we see the calculations going on in real time, um, and. Um, and we we visualize with graphs our changing knowledge of the world from um, from these series of samples. I'm using math jacks here, um, and um, you can see it's kind of fun to to. Uh, to see the, the calculations update as we we take um, one sample per second, we can we can speed that up just for fun. We go to five samples per second. Uh, this is all going on in the browser. Um, um, all of the calculations. There's no. Um, no service side to this. This is all uh, all of these um, distributions are being calculated in, as we watch in in the browser. Is the actual distribution? As, as I've been working through this uh, statistical rethinking book, I've. Then I've created further um, visualizations of of the calculations that we've we've been talking about the sampling from the posterior taking samples from our posterior to 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 uh, to understand. The, the model of the world that we we built up from um, this first calculation that go 
we go on to the to a second calculation, analyzing um, analyzing what we found. Uh, Jamie, is it a good time to stop for a question? I I even attempted to to create a. a more um, ambitious visualization showing showing Bayesian updating of two parameters at once of um, of the the mean and the standard deviation, the relative likelihood of the mean and standard deviation of a set of data based on um, samples that increase in amounts of samples of the data. There, oh, these graphs are, um, we're using Vega, the Vega Light library, which is, um, I think it takes its inspiration from ggplot, the, the grammar of graphics in, in ggplot. The, the uh, Vega Light uses a similar grammar of graphics approach, but um, the, the graphs are described in, in JSON, um, in a JSON data structure. And that's uh, developed by Washington State University. They um, they they've uh, they, they've developed this library. The UI of this is um, is prettified with by using um, semantic UI components, which. Which give me some nice um, CSS styling for for my page. Um, how to move that? Yeah. Uh, Toolbar has appeared at the top of my screen, which is obstructing my view of the browser. No, I wasn't there before. How do I get rid of it? Let me just move it down here. Yeah. Um, Let me show you uh, the, the code that produces this, this application. Oh, uh, have you any questions about um, any questions so far? Uh, can you hear us okay, Jen? So this is this is the code for um, for one of these pages for the for this first tab. Um, I've used one namespace to describe each each of the tabs. And um, closure script allows us to do. Because it's a functional programming language, as I was saying earlier, I really like this concept of separating out your state. And I think that um, the the storage of the the memory, I guess, I think of it as the memory component of your application. The the, the thing, the, the the 
parts of your application that can um, that, that store the that that um, that can change. Um, we separate out the the state of the application that for this tab, that's all at the top here. These are the, the only parts of the, the, the only moving parts of the application. And, um, and uh, uh, the HTML, the JavaScript, is all um, changes over time because the, the the functions to create the 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 HTML, the JavaScript are are processing this uh, this changing state. So we we have state, and then we have the the, um, I'm sure other people could put this better than me, but um, we have state and the and the the functionality to transform um, data uh, separated into two two areas. But that allows us to. Um, because the state is um, is kind of siloed like this um, in these these atoms, as Theodore said, we can we can track the changes of these these atoms. We're able to uh, the not the compiler. I, I misspoke earlier, but the the, the library is able to to know which are the reactive parts of the which are the parts of the the page that change um, because they're they're taking these this uh, state as input. I don't think I'm I'm doing a very good at expressing all of this. I'm I'm not used to putting this this stuff into words. Um, but yeah, we, we <clears throat> just to to walk you through the code. We we probably. Want to start at the bottom here with this um, this page function is the the um, generates the the page that the, this page that you saw earlier and the different parts of it and um, So reagent has this strange or well, interesting syntax where you your um, your function returns this this is called hiccup this um, array nested array of arrays that uh, that declare the um, the HTML of your page. And um, ah, here's here's an example of um, this is a, a a reagent cursor that um, that is referencing the state that um, that we declared at the top of the page and. Um, this is uh, 
this is a a boolean of whether to um, whether to collapse or on or show um, a particular part of the page. Um, uh, and the the reagent library knows that when this this part of the atom changes, that this HTML part of this HTML needs to be re re rendered. So I think what it does is um, it it re-renders the HTML and decides what parts need, if there's differences and if the, what parts need changing. Um, I'm not completely clear of what's, I um, don't know exactly what's going on under the hood. It just works that um, you, you can write your, your uh, HTML um, and have the the HTML output dependent on the these atoms, and when you change these atoms, the then the 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 HTML is just um, automatically re re rendered for you. And that, that goes also for these graphs. They're, um, uh, they're all based on, on this part of the, the page state that, that um, keeps track of, of the random samples that we're generating on the fly and um, um, as the the random samples are are generated the calculations up update in in real time uh, yeah you see all over the page, I've got references to um, this, this atom. So here, for example, if we haven't had in, depending on how many samples we've taken already, I'm changing the, um, which buttons are, are displayed. The, um, the graphs themselves. I'm, I'm passing in the, the page state that I've already dereferenced de into this, into this function and generating, generating the graphs. Is there anything you you would like me to to cover? Um, I've, I I think I'm pretty much done. I just wanted to briefly show you um, show you my code. Um, yeah. So I, I think I think it was a really nice way to get a little taste of this project, which is going on and we will hear more about it surely because you keep creating those animated uh, uh, interactive uh, notebooks and um maybe right. maybe uh, we should okay. mention that I could, um i could tell you where we um i think you were gonna you, you were going there danielle that we're thinking about um trying to make a 
a bridge between closure and, and stand so that we can um, so that we can do Monte Carlo Markov chain analysis um, in closure. Yeah, and th maybe that will really belongs to another discussion and possibly another book. Uh, but for now, we could just mention that yeah. all this is something that uh, JB, Jamie has been creating in this joint pro community, which is uh, 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 polyglot community, a community of different programming languages meeting together and discussing Bayesian statistics. And Jamie has been a driving force there, actually creating so much content and encouraging everybody to, to learn more and imagine how things could be visualized and understood in visual ways. And it is, these plots are really inspiring in, you know, in being able to actually grasp closure script and Bayesian statistics at the same time and actually drive this community to imagine those, those directions. And so Ricky, thank you so much, Jamie, for, for everything you are pushing into this uh, uh, joint prop group. And I think we will have more of these visualizations in the coming weeks and months and learn more about how you do these things. So thank you for this little taste of that today. And now we have a few minutes to the official time and then those who wish to stay could stay a little longer. Maybe it is a good moment for a few short questions or comments and then maybe Theodore you would like to show something about that, Tops, if you wish. Yeah, so I, I unfortunately have to uh, sign off. Uh, oh, but, yeah, uh, so some other time. Thank you. Yeah, for but thank you so much to uh, Jamie and, and Adam. Uh, uh, it was really great to see the different approaches and the kind of the easy approach to get started with and the really flexible approach that Jamie showed where he kind of can change whatever he wants. Hmm. Okay. Bye. Yeah, so, so really, uh, thank you so much, Adam and Jamie. We were seeing these two ends as as uh, Theodore uh, mentioned it, and we will keep learning, I think, about the R ecosystem. There is a uh, hope to have a session about this Quarto uh, uh, literate programming framework, which is common in the R ecosystem. And uh, maybe Kira would like to comment about it today or some other time. And in general, we will keep learning about other ecosystems. And um, does anybody have any comment or question about the whole session before we end the official part? Yeah, great. So maybe maybe some concluding words uh, by you, Adam, and by you, Jamie, uh, before we end the recording. How would you like to conclude? I'd like to say uh, thank you, Danielle, for the opportunity to speak today. It was really great uh, getting to share my our experience with the closure community and seeing like the different extremes of uh, high customizability and the ease of use uh, afforded by R and its uh, much larger ecosystem. And I think there's a lot to be thought about in terms of like maybe introducing different layers or levels of uh, easiness to using uh, closure to create maybe dashboards, maybe web applications for visualization, and then having the ability to remove la the layer and expose the code and have that be customizable. There is a lot more to be discussed and uh, I am enjoying the journey of learning about closure, the ecosystem and all of this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank Danielle as well for organizing all the organizing he does, all the different groups he um, he's involved in facilitating. And um, yeah, and thanks for listening to my presentation. Cheers. <laughs>